I considered this morning maybe being cruel to you and springing a geography quiz on you. I'll let you judge for yourselves. How many of you think that you could spot Rwanda on a map? Uh, kind of puzzled expressions. See, it's the unfortunate truth of Americans in general that we don't know where a country is until we bombed them. That's generally when we learn our geography. Rwanda, here's the map, by the way. It's right there in the middle. There were warning signs at first. In March of 1994, a man living there imported 50,000 machetes. He was a Hutu, one of two ethnic groups that live in Rwanda, Hutus and Tutsis. They speak the same language, they live in the same areas, they share similar traditions, and most of us would be very hard-pressed to spot any real differences between these two men. The taller one is the Tutsi. But early colonizers from Belgium, when they came into Rwanda, they put the Tutsis in power. Years and years later, simmering resentments from that and economic difficulties just created a, a worse and worse situation. There had been outbreaks of violence between the two groups before, but there was suddenly a sense that something much worse, much larger, was about to happen. Then on April 6th of 1994, the president, who was in Hutu, died in a mysterious plane crash. Word spread that Tutsi forces were behind its downing, but they had shot it down. The killing began that night. Hutu militias went door to door, killing Tutsis. They set up roadblocks to prevent them from escaping. The next day, they began to kill the moderate Tutsis, anyone who wouldn't turn over their Tutsi neighbors and friends. The new prime minister went on the radio and supported calls for Hutus to abuse, hurt, and kill the Tutsis and the moderate Hutus. One month in, the UN passed a resolution condemning the killings, but didn't want to use the word genocide. <laughs> After another month of these continued killings, they said, okay, maybe it is genocide. They committed to send in some troops, but some fighting between the U.S. and the U.N. over how we were going to pay for it delayed their deployment for another month. In 100 days, something like 800,000 people were murdered. 300,000 of them were children. It is evil on a scale that I find difficult to imagine. Not only the horrors of what happened, but what do you do after something like that? I mean, the scars that were left on those that survived eventually heal. But there are some wounds that a hospital cannot treat. There are some scars that stay on our souls that remain long after the bodies are buried and the wounded are treated. In the next few weeks, we will talk about the aftermath of these events and what it means to forgive. I'm working out of an incredibly powerful book, fittingly named As We Forgive, that describes the, the events that happened in the aftermath. If you don't have a copy of this book, if you've never even heard about it, I strongly recommend uh, you going. I bought it on Kindle. Uh, for like 99 cents, it was on sale. Uh, as, as we go through and spend the next few weeks talking about forgiveness. See, forgiveness is, is difficult, especially when we've been wronged, when evil has been done. See, what, what tends to happen instead of forgiveness is increasing cycles of violence. 
Come on, if you had a sibling and they punch you in the arm, you don't just punch them back, you punch them back a little harder. And then they hit you a little harder until your parents show up and ruin everything. In case you haven't watched the news at all in the past few weeks, I'll sum something up for you. Some white nationalists and neo-Nazis got upset about something and came out to protest it. Other people responded by protesting then, and some people showed up to punch them in the nose. Then it escalated to murder. For some, the appropriate response to all that is more violence and murder against those responsible. In fact, just a few days ago, there was a guy in New York who got stabbed because he had a haircut, I guess, that made him look like a neo-Nazi. Somebody ran up to him without any discussion and attempted to stab him in the face. Now, this isn't a new thing in our country. Even a few years ago, I remember seeing in the news, there was some protest over health care, and one of the guys bit the other dude's finger off. What began with the discussion led to somebody only being able to count to nine for the rest of their life. At the start of the book of 2 Samuel, there's a civil war breaking out. King Saul had been chasing David, who God had chosen to replace him around the countryside for years. Saul is dead. They crown David king. Other people crown Saul son and king, and they have a war. Two generals, Abner and Joab, meet, and they start a battle. Abner is defeated. Joab's brother is chasing him down. Abner pleads with him to stop. He doesn't, so he kills Joab's brother. Abner is then cornered, and he makes a plea. 2 Samuel 2, 26. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? He's got his back to the wall, and they were getting ready to slaughter everyone that remained. And he makes this plea, and Joab says, All right, I will let you go. Unfortunately, in the cycle of human nature, Joab later finds Abner and murders him in cold blood. David, on his deathbed, then has Joab killed for murdering Abner, for killing Joab's brother who tried to kill Abner. Do you see how the cycle of violence continues? When will that, When will enough blood be shed? And the answer is never without forgiveness. During the killings, one of the slogans for Hutu radio was, the graves are not yet full. 800,000 people dead. And they still said, the graves are not yet full. We have to understand that without forgiveness, violence will escalate and escalate until everyone is dead. I am concerned at seeing our nation separate into these different tribes. We're not Hutus and, and Tutsis, but each of these little tribes is so convinced that the other tribe is responsible for all of the problems. I'm starting to wonder if machetes are going to begin selling out on Amazon the way solar eclipse glasses do. But sometimes instead of buying machetes, we try and bury the conflict instead of resolving it, instead of seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. And this happens in families. It might have been something that happened years ago, but it ends like the Korean War did. The Korean War was never end by an act, ended by an actual peace treaty. It was a temporary ceasefire. There was no resolution to it. Both sides just agreed we're going to stop killing each other for now. And this happens in families. Those conflicts, they are buried. They are not resolved. And it looks like the, the Korean Peninsula. We have a demilitarized zone of that kitchen table during family holidays where both sides sit on both ends and they stare at each other, keeping eye on the other, waiting for the fighting to begin again. Let me tell you something. If you are someone 
who does this and you bury conflict rather than seeking to resolve it. I want you to know that you're not fooling anyone. You're not. You, you may think, and you're around that person, you try so, so hard to watch your words around them. But let me tell you, you cannot bury bitterness so deep that it does not well up and show itself. Jesus said that the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. You are not fooling anyone. I mean, I talk to you. Your problem isn't even with me. And I can tell you hate the person. So if we don't want to go and buy machetes, and if we're honest, our attempts at ignoring the situation doesn't work, we then maybe try and run from it instead of confronting it. You say, well, if that person shops at Harps, I'm just going to shop at Town & Country instead. Deal with it. And you know, of course, this doesn't work so well in marriages, right? Like your attempt at moving to the other side of the sofa is not creating enough distance without forgiveness. Those everyday wrongs, those treading on your toes, those stealing of the sheets. By the way, on Amazon, but you can buy sheet defenders. You hear these things? They are clamps. Clamps that you can attach to your bag that will physically hold the sheets on your side for the low price of like $19.95. Yet that's not going to fix the problem, is it? Come home and she's got industrial equipment set up. So what happens without forgiveness, without grace, is those little offenses, they pile up. Like in Paris when the garbage collectors went on strike. And people were still producing garbage. There was just nobody to take it away. So they just threw it out on the street. And it piles up, and it piles up, and the city is still beautiful. The city is still amazing to look at, but when you walk outside the door, you're not seeing the Eiffel Tower. You're smelling the garbage. This happens in marriages every day. The lack of forgiveness, and, and it just piles up, and it piles up. And... It is polluted and defined by the stench. We try other things because forgiveness is hard. It was incredibly hard in the aftermath of genocide. There were cycles of violence. Later echoes of the genocide when Tutsis came into power and thousands of Hutus were killed in retaliation. Some of them ran. 1.5 million Hutus fled the country because they were afraid, because they were guilty. Many tried to bury the past and simply refused to talk about what had happened. They still had the scars and the bitterness and the hurt and the pain and it's especially difficult to ignore when one in four Hutus had participated in some way in the violence and the killings. Can you imagine the tension that followed? You're living in the same village. You've got families that are torn apart in that suspicion. If you're a Tutsi and you see your Hutu neighbor and you wonder, are they just here because they didn't get caught? Unforgiveness is like an open sore that doesn't heal. It is one of the greatest sources of human suffering. 
It is not just the evil that is done. It is the bitterness that follows. And again, I, I want you to know, as I go through this, um, you know, with my mom, and I shared with you all, you know, earlier in the situation, my mom, alcoholic for many years, and there was hurt and pain that had accumulated over time, and I felt like I had forgiven her, but I struggled with it, and I held on to it, and let me tell you, one of the greatest sources of just pain in my life was this open wound that any time I talked to her, any time I had interaction with her, even though I worked at forgiving her, it wasn't closed up. And, it was, and it's like that scab that you pick at, you pick at it, gets infected, the, the area is inflamed. And it's on both sides, for the victim and the offender. On her deathbed, she shared that how every day she carried with her the knowledge that she had hurt her kids. And she had not forgiven herself. Even as she cursed us, she collected and printed pictures that we had posted online and bragged to her friends about us. And yet that failure to have resolution and peace was a daily burden that she carried. This grieves us, but it grieves God. Ephesians 4, 30 and 31. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. You know, it's confounding for me that God, who created all of the universe and all of the stars in the sky and wrote the laws of physics, that he could be emotionally impacted by us when we hold on to bitterness. We grieve God. I mean, it'd be like walking next door to your neighbor and finding them weeping in the backyard over some ants that are fighting. How can it be that he cares that much about us? That he is so intimately involved in our personal lives that your decision to hold on to that hurt affects him. Yet he does. We were created for love and peace and unity, not only with God, but with each other. Your malice is like mold on his masterpiece. Your bitterness is like a cigarette burn on the beauty of his creation. And your anger is like a Nickelback song in a playlist of otherwise good music. Stepped on some toes there. So we're called to get rid of it. And sometimes we grieve God to the extent that He intervenes and forces our hand. And this happened in Rwanda. More than a decade later, they faced a situation in their prison. So you have this genocide. And the whole country is involved. And so they throw a bunch of people in prison. And they have a situation where their prison system is holding 120,000 people. It was designed to hold a maximum of 20,000. So you have an extra 100,000 human beings created in the image of God that took up arms against their neighbors. And so they decided to do something about it. In 2003, trying to deal with this, they began to release these people back into the villages where they killed people. They began with those who confessed their crimes, the low-level killers and looters, the sick and the elderly, the rapists. How would you feel if a murderer was released from prison 
to move in next door to you. You know, O.J. Simpson buys the house next door. Can you imagine not just one, but 60,000 of them? Not just a murderer, but someone who killed members of your family. One survivor who lost 142 family members. I'll say it again. 142 family members hearing the news of this asked, this time will they kill us all? One of the killers facing his own release said this, I was so overjoyed, but fear lingered also. How was I going to face a survivor and squarely look her in the eyes after I had wiped out her family? And so what followed is recorded in the book as we forgive. And this is a situation no political party or person could possibly fix. And yet the gospel shines brightest in dark situations. Dedicated aid workers came in to start the process of confession and repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration. That's what we're going to launch into these next few weeks. I think we can all agree that these are things that we desperately need, not just in our country, but in our own lives as well. And I, I can't tell you how incredibly convicting it was for me to read this book and to consider grace beyond comprehension when I won the paper cuts sometimes. So what I want to challenge you to do today is to come before God, and the starting point is to acknowledge Areas in your life where you have not forgiven other people. And it may be things like, like I struggled with, where it's a, a back and forth situation, and you, you've struggled with this for years, but if you're honest with yourself, you're not where you know that you need to be. Maybe there is someone that you have wronged, and the knowledge that they have not forgiven you, it eats away at you inside, and you long for that peace and wholeness that God created you for. Will you pray with me as we begin this journey together that the outcome would be not grief, the Holy Spirit, but God celebrating with us and with you as we seek peace and pursue it. Let's pray. God, sometimes uh, we have a tendency to think that all is well until we hear a person's name or we see their face, or something they post, or a mention by a friend, and then we are caught up in that spiral. We want to repay our hurt with hurt. It is easy for us to seek revenge. But sometimes we just want to bury it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to consider these things. And yet, God, as often as we bury it, we can't seem to dig a hole deep enough. It keeps coming back up, and we keep facing it again and running away from it, God. We try and avoid those people. God, I pray that you would convict us this morning, that you would call us out of our fear. That you would give us the courage to begin that difficult, sometimes long and sometimes painful process of forgiving people because you forgave us. God, you did not sit distant 
from us. You did not simply let us go on our way. You pursued us. You paid the cost. You didn't pay us back as we deserve. And you call us to do the same with others. It is only po possible through the power of your son Jesus.